Hi and welcome everybody. My name is uh, Barry Kersbergen. I'm an expert software engineer at the online retailer Bol.com and today I want to discuss the multi-factor recommended system that we built at Bol.com. Uh, topics that we want to have discussed today are uh, about this new recommender system. Uh, until a few years ago, we would periodically process web event data to calculate and predict recommendations. However, these, this worked great at the time. However, these recommendations did not always align with the user's intent on site, and nor were we able to recommend items to anonymous visitors. So uh, that's why we built this new system. Uh, the topics that I want to discuss today is what does it take to develop a uh, working uh, an operational recommender system, and what are the crucial customer behavioral factors involved, and what is the impact of the visual presentation of the item being recommended. Who am I? Uh, my name is Barry Kersbergen. I have uh, a background in computer science. I've worked at the University of Utrecht for over 12 years, where I worked on the computer science and mathematics uh, department, where I've worked on uh, educational mathematical software. I started joining working at Bol.com in 2010, where I'm uh, situated in a team that specializes in personalizing content, and the recommender system we're talking about is one of these systems. What is Bol.com? Bol is uh, one of the largest uh, Dutch online retailers. It started in 1999 with selling books, and over the years we've added a large number of categories. Uh, recently, we won the award for being the best web shop, which I'm very proud of, uh, especially since it's regarded the use of uh, using personal recommendations and the use of big data, mm -hmm. which is also what this talk is about today. So this Berlin Buzzwords track is about scalability. So why is it so important to focus on scalability when developing a recommender system? Well, to answer that question, I want to have a look at uh, physical, uh, uniquely sold products sold per type of store. So your average supermarket sells about 10,000 unique products. An extra-large supermarket sells about 20,000. I looked that up on the website, so must be correct. Uh, so what I've done is I've created this graph where you see on the x-axis the number of weeks passing by, and on the y-axis you can see the number of products being added or removed to our catalog. And what you see here is that an extra-large supermarket gets added to our catalog about every four days, which is a large amount of uh, products. Please notice the spike on the right, which is over 350,000 products being added to our catalog in just a small number of time. It's almost impossible to think what these items are. Um, we sell over 8 million products online on our website, and in the backend system for a recommender, we have over 20 million products that we calculate recommendations for. The difference between these two is the products that we can, liver, uh, can or cannot deliver to our customers. So customers on a website are interacting with these products and they generate approximately over 50 million product events each day. So that's over uh, five and a half billion click events each year. But why should we only be interested in click events? Because they only tell us so much. What we really find, want to find out is what the customer is actually doing on our website. For instance, how long does he look at a product? Does he read the product reviews? Does he share the product on social media? Does he add the item on a wish list? Or what products does the visitor click? And is the click product a recommendation? Because if the click product is a recommendation, then we're probably doing a good job in inspiring the customer. But if the customer is not interacting with everything that we throw at him, we're probably not doing such a good job, and maybe we want to switch strategy and try something different. So dealing with these amounts of data requires us to use scalable technology. So that's why we started using Hadoop in 2009 and the first application went into production in 2010. So why did we want to build a recommender system from scratch? Well, first off, we had the non-functional requirements. It needed to be horizontally scalable and it needs to perform in real time. Well, the combination of real time and big data is always a little bit confusing. In this situation, that means in, in milliseconds. We let our customer wait until we have updated in real time the data, and then we return content to our customer. So it needs to be really fast. This means milliseconds. It, of course, needs to handle our volume of data. And last but not, not least, we need to be able to explain the workings of our system to our stakeholder, because together we can realize any business requirements that they might have. So, building such a system seems like scary stuff. So how do we tackle this? Well, we do this uh, with uh, taking small steps. We have the Scrum software uh, development methodology, 
where we uh, use multidisciplinary teams. So a team is uh, combined with uh, different specialists all in a different field of study. Uh, so everything that you need is in the team. What we try to do is we try to build vertical slices. This means that we try to build a small feature for a recommender system. And we try to have it in production and being released after two weeks. So we do, don't do long trajects and uh, passing on the software to different departments. But we try to main, maintain focus and do small steps. This allows us to do releases in two weeks. <clears throat> and as soon as the software is being released, we get feedback from the production and see how it's working and we can expand our functionalities. So what you see is as the user stories gets burned down, we get uh, features released to production. The value of our system increases. And this allows us to do uh, really complex things in a small amount of time. So now let's talk about the recommendations. So what do you recommend to millions of visitors? In the contrast to a physical store, we can't go up to our customer and ask for what he or she might need. Our customers are completely unknown to us, and most of our visitors are also anonymous. So what do you recommend to somebody that you don't know? Well, for instance, what would you recommend me? If you know me, you might know that my household consumes a large number of diapers each week. And I also like listening to Avenged Sevenfold. Uh, but do I like to be recommended about these items? So for instance, what would you recommend me? And can the effect of the recommendation be approved by adapting it to the customer's need? Well, before we can answer that question, let's have a look at an example where recommendations are shown on our website, a product detail page, which shows details about a product. For instance, this is the book, uh, HBase book, and on the lower end of the screen, we show items that might be of interest to you, whether it be books from the same publisher or the same author or the same topic. And this is all derived from behavior that you expressed on the website right now and the behavior of different customers on the website who are also interested in these products. So customers are recommending uh, products to other customers. Um, so this is all nice, but how can we tell that these are good, the best recommendations that we have? Uh, First off, what we do is we visualize the output data just to get a sense of what we're actually recommending to our customers. So what we do is we, uh, we load uh, the uh, new software and all data involved to an acceptance environment uh, where our business stakeholders can really get a feel of how the system is working on a clean environment that's only accessible to Bolt.com employees only. So that should really give us a feel of how it's working. Then, of course, we also do the offline recommender evaluation and we run algorithms that express the numerical value of how the system is doing. This allows us to tune parameters and see if we can optimize for some predictive behavior. A very known uh, error metric, which I'm not going to discuss right now, is of course the root mean squared error, um, which allows you to optimize your parameters just by running over the algorithms over and over again, trying different parameters. But is that all we can do? For instance, if the data looks okay and you have a low numerical error, do you have the best recommender that you can have on your website? Well, to answer that question, I want to have a look at a hypothetical, uh, hypothetical gas station that hires us to uh, do recommendations for a gas station. So the requirements for this system is that it needs to support anonymous and unknown customers. Of course, it needs to be really fast. And of course, we like the low numerical error. And the recommendation is considered successfully if the customer buys the item after seeing the recommendation first. So what happens is a truck comes along to the gas station. It's a new and unknown customer. It's a tow truck, so we recommend diesel. We've learned this. And does the customer buy the item after seeing it as a recommendation? Yes, he does. Then a different car comes along. It's also a new and unknown customer. It's a sports car, so we recommend petrol. And does the customer buy the item after seeing this as a recommendation? Yes, he does. So what's the evaluation? The data looks okay. We have a low error, low error value. We were able to accurately predict the recommendations and almost everything that we recommend gets bought. Wow, this is a good recommender system. Well, to tell you the truth, I don't know. Uh, from a commerce point of view, my point would be, what is the additional uh, added value for using this recommender system? If it adds value, then it's a good recommender system. But if it doesn't add value, 
then it's no, of no, you, no use. So common error metrics tells you the ability to accurately predict and see how well the recommended system is able to, uh, to measure how well the system is able to uh, predict some behavior compared to the true behavior. But from a commerce point of view, we want to add value to the customer experience. And the customer experience is perceived differently among customers and even differently among time. So how do we tackle such a complex, uh, complex problem? What we do is we do long-term analysis. What we want to find out is how is the performance of this recommended system over time. One thing that we find very important is to know, do the visitors return after buying a recommendation? Another thing that we do is we analyze the behavior because this learns us about how we can build new features and add real uh, new value to the uh, system that we've built. And last but not least, we do live user experiments, of course, without telling the users. So how does such a system work? Well, a recommender is a data-driven uh, data decision maker. So we want to optimize the combination of algorithms that we use. We also want to optimize the user interface in which we present the recommendations with. And sometimes we, all, we, all, we also want to optimize the user interaction flows. So we, we've developed our own experimentation framework uh, to find out if the customers really prefer the left version of the right version of the road. So how does such a system work? Well, that's pretty easy. What we do is a customer comes to our website and requests for some content. And let's say there's a recommendation slot, so the a call is being made to our recommender system for get me some recommendations for customer one, two, three. Then the experimentation framework is in between. And it classifies the user, which could be arbitrarily random. 50% of the users get the old algorithm. 50% of the users get the new algorithm. The recommender system is recommending the algorithm A or B depending on the classification, and the recommendations are returned to the website, and this is presented to our visitors. Then we also, without the customer knowing this, we measure the effect, so we're able to report the differences over time, and this allows us to learn if the new version is really an improvement over the uh, control. So what are the ex uh, some results that we've learned through uh, live user experiments? So this is an example of a recommendation for a certain visitor. It's a, a set of pants. So one thing we've learned is that we want to optimize and personalize the product attributes being shown to a customer. So depending on your profile, we either show you uh, some attributes, and for some other customers, we show different attributes. So in the left picture, this has a lot of technical facts. And what you see on the right side is the same product being recommended to some specific customer. However, it has different product attributes highlighted. So the product as well as the visualization is personalized for this customer. And what we've learned is this can really add a lot of value. What is another example of what we learned through experimentation? Is, uh, this is a recommendation selected for you because you like data mining. Uh, this is all derived from implicit feedback that we get from the user. So what is he actually doing on the site? We thought, well, maybe it might be a good idea to incorporate the user and have him interact with the recommender system. So we added a feature where the user can interact with the recommendations and say if he did or did not like this recommendation and try to improve the recommendations for him. And for some users, this really adds a lot of value. Now let's have a look at an example of where we show recommendations. Well, we could uh, personalize this whole page and show different kinds of recommendations, but at this specific moment in time, this is what we show. So what you see here is uh, recommendations based on the things that you interact with with your wish list. We can also recommend search queries to you. We're also able to recommend some general personalized recommendations. However, as you can see, it, it, this does not contain feedback, why we recommend this to you. We're also able to recommend deals for you, or even price changes. Or the thing I like best is uh, recommending categories to users, and where we can uh, recommend trends for you. I'm really proud of that. So, <laughs> so what have we just seen? We're able. So what we're basically doing is recommending algorithms and output to users, and the output of the algorithms is content, which could be products, authors, artists, deals categories, you name it, we can recommend it. And this is all done with a personalized user interface. So what we recommend and how we recommend it to you is personalized. We're also able to determine the priority in which we want to show the content on the page. 
We can do this over multiple channels, because what we've seen is that when visitors enter their website, they start in the morning using their mobile device. Then at 11 o'clock, they come back using an old PC, using an old browser. Then at uh, 6 o'clock, they come back using a tablet. And then at 8 o'clock, they come and enter the site right away, do the purchase, and then they leave. So we want to optimize this over all channels. So the perception is complete. So what should be the ultimate level of personalization? Well, since I work in a team specialized in personalization, I may not have an unbiased opinion about this, but in my opinion, it should be this. What we, of course, try to do is recommend the right item to our customer. It should be uh, in the right presentation. It should be in the right place because we don't want to surprise our visitors. And it has to have the right promotion, which means price. And it has to have the right timing. The right timing means it has to be convenient for the visitor. And last but not least, we want to have the right frequency. Because if we only show the recommendation once, we're not, able, we're not sure if the visitor didn't see the recommendation or did he not like it. But if we repeat it too often, then it might get irritating because we show the uh, recommendation 50 times to you and you're still not interacting with the recommendation. So that might also be a clue that we're not doing a good job. Um, so how does this real-time behavior that we all just discussed uh, constrain the recommender system? What we want to find out in real-time is what would really add value to the customer given his current context. Because if he's uh, searching for a TV in our search engine, then he's probably orientating for, and he has no clue of what TV he's probably going to buy. But if he's looking for a Samsung SM52000 with cable, then he probably has a good idea of what he's trying to purchase. And then it would uh, confuse the customer in, in trying to sell different types of TVs. So this is something that we need to find out in real time. And what do we already know about this customer? How does he uh, interact with our recommendations? Are we able to inspire this customer? And what should be the level of personalization? Well, the real challenge in this is that we have to determine uh, what to do with the time given to us. So technically, that means 100 milliseconds, but due to network overhead, we have only about 70 or 80 milliseconds. So every milliseconds count. So what are some uh, hints that I want to give you? Is try to cache expensive data. This could be anything from a database lookup till a uh, expensive computation. If you need it on later on, maybe you want to cache the result just to make sure that we're not trying to calculate the same thing over and over again. And definitely try to tune and uh, try different JDBC connectivity components. What I've seen in practice is that we were able to uh, cut down the database calls with over 10 or 20 milliseconds just by tuning the right parameters for your specific query. And last but not least, every JDK comes with a uh, Visual VM Java profiler. Use this. This really helps you in uh, getting a good idea of where your actual computations are being spent. So, thank you very much for listening to my talk. If you have any questions, if there is time, you can ask them to me. No time, so uh, come back to me. I'll be downstairs at our booth. Thank you very much. <laughs>